those seedlings grow, organic substances, food, must move from the storage tissues in the seed to the growing roots and shoots. And throughout the rest of their lives, plants need a fast, efficient transport system to carry the food materials, such as sugars and amino acids and certain ions, from the tissues where they're synthesized or stored to the tissues where they're used, the sinks. The transport of food substances takes place in the phloem tissue. The phloem tissue is found next to the xylem, the water conducting tissue, in vascular bundles. In this scanning electron micrograph, we can see a cross section of the petiole of a water plant. Let's look more closely at the vascular bundle in the middle of this petiole. Here is the xylem. And here are the sieve elements and sieve tubes in the phloem tissue. The sieve tubes have pores in their end walls, and these connect them end to end to form a pipe, the sieve tube. And it's through this pipe that the food substances are transported from one part of the plant to another. The end walls are called sieve plates because they look like a sieve. In this length of film, we can see a vascular bundle which has been cut parallel to its length to expose the sieve elements. Here are the ends of two sieve elements. They're separated by a sieve plate. You can make out the pores in the sieve plate. For technical reasons, the particles are shown moving rather faster than they would normally. How do the sieve elements join up to make a sieve tube? The young sieve elements look much like any other young plant cells. They contain a lot of cytoplasm and a nucleus, and they are surrounded by a cell wall. As the sieve elements are developing, they lose their nuclei, and the cytoplasm comes to line the cell wall. While all this is going on, the sieve pores are being opened through the sieve plates to join the sieve elements end to end to form a sieve tube. But even the fully formed sieve tubes are not empty pipes. They are not unobstructed. They come to contain fine filaments of a substance called P protein, P for phloem. And these filaments are sometimes found in the pores. So phloem is a vascular tissue and it's always closely associated with xylem. But unlike xylem, the cells of phloem, including the sieve tubes, are all living. This phloem parenchyma cell illustrates a characteristic property of living cells. Their cytoplasm constantly streams, and it often carries along organelles like these plastids. Now, you can't see streaming in sieve tubes because the plastids, the markers, are usually anchored to the side walls. But often you do see rather random jostling movements of particles. These are starch grain, but they're not showing streaming. This is Brownian movement. These globules of milk fat are doing the same thing. Brownian movement is simply the random movement of particles caused by random collisions between solvent and solute molecules with the particles. Brownian movement causes considerable problems when it comes to interpreting phloem structure. Apart from being alive, and therefore needing a supply of energy and having streaming cytoplasm, there are two other important physiological properties of phloem. First of all, the sieve tubes have a high turga, the pressure caused when the cell contents press against the cell wall. And this means that if a sieve tube is punctured, the contents rush out of the cell. And this is what's happening here. It's a cut stem of hogweed, Heraclium, and those are the sieve tube contents pouring out of the cut end. The high turga arises because sieve tubes have a very high solute content. It's usually around 5 to 20% sugar, mostly sucrose, but with small amounts of amino acids and certain other organic acids. And some insects exploit this as a rich source of food. The mouth part of an aphid is the stylet. Now, aphids have a remarkable ability to push their stylets between the cells of a plant and insert it with great precision into a single sieve tube. Because of the high turga there, the sugary sap in the phloem surges up the aphid stylet, and the aphid just sits there, essentially being force-fed. 
The second important feature of sieve tubes is the very fast rate at which substances like sugars are transported along them. They can move as fast as several meters an hour, although more usually it's in the region of 60 to 120 centimeters an hour. So let's see how people actually measure rates of transport in film. One way to measure the velocity of translocation is apply, to apply a radioactive tracer to a leaf and to see how long it takes to reach some other part of the plant. In this experiment, we are following a tracer from a leaf past two Geiger counters. But in this kind of experiment, we can only obtain minimum rates because we must be certain the tracer has accumulated under the Geiger counters before we can be certain that it has arrived. A solution of phosphorus 32 is being applied to the cut end of a vein in this flap cut from the leaf here. It will move up into the leaf and then down the veins out of the leaf and down the stem to the Geiger counters. Now, in this kind of experiment, these are the kinds of curves that we will obtain. If we know the distance between the two Geiger counters, then we can work out the velocity of translocation. But we must remember that some of the tracer may have leaked sideways, and therefore the rates that we measure may be slower than the actual rates in the sieve tubes. And they may be, uh, the actual rate may be faster than the 36 centimeters an hour or so which these curves show but we still don't know how the translocation is driven. So how do SIF tubes function? How can they transport substances at these remarkably fast rates? Well, the first theory about flow and movement suggested that it was simply differences in pressure that cause movement, and the solution moved by simple mass or bulk flow. This was Ernstmann's classic pressure flow hypothesis, which he first suggested about 50 years ago. I can demonstrate the principle of the hypothesis using this simple model. Imagine that this tube is a series of sieve tubes. Now, this end is the source end of the pathway. In the plant, it will be a tissue that can supply or synthesize sugars. Water would enter the sieve tube by osmosis, so the pressure inside, the turga, would rise. And the solution will then move by simple mass or bulk flow from the high pressure source end of the tube to the lower pressure sink end. In the plant, sugars and water would move out of the sieve tube here. Now, notice that we've put a hole in this plate here to simulate a sieve plate. OK, well, let's see what happens when I switch the pump on. We've got a flow rate of about 600 litres an hour, and that's with a pressure on the pump of about four units. But you've seen sieve plates earlier in the program, and they're not really like this. They're much more solid with lots of small holes in them. And we've now got a plate here that's got eight small holes in it. Right, well, now let's see what happens when I put the pump on again. To maintain that flow rate of 600 litres an hour, we've now got to use a pressure of eight units on this pump. So it needs considerably more pressure, in fact. So a crucial question for the pressure flow hypothesis is, are the pressure differences that can be measured along sieve tubes sufficiently great to cause mass flow at the observed velocities? People have done calculations to try and answer this question. And in theory, the answer is yes, provided that the sieve tubes and the sieve plates particularly are relatively unblocked. If they're even slightly obstructed, then impossibly high pressures are needed to cause mass flow at the observed velocities. So you see, it's crucial for the pressure flow hypothesis to know what the fine structure of the sieve tubes and the sieve plates is really like. And this is where my problems began. I wanted to find out what the structure of a translocating sieve tube was while it was actually working. And the sieve tubes uh, can be seen, even in an ordinary light microscope, to be obstructed with a material which is called slime. Later, the slime was shown to contain protein. It's now usually called P-protein. 
The P protein is made of fine filaments, which we can see in this electron micrograph. The pores are full of the filaments, which are generally less than 30 nanometers in diameter. They're produced in P-protein bodies in immature sieve elements. The filaments get blown into the sieve pores by release of turga when sieve tubes are being prepared for sectioning. Here is a micrograph which shows them against the sieve plate. But if they blow about so easily, where are they in undamaged translocating sieve tubes? Are there still some in the pores normally? And if so, how much resistance to flow would they produce? We just don't know. The trouble is that sieve elements seem so easily damaged. Not only can filaments be blown into the pores, but callos, a polysaccharide, can form in the pores too. It can close them within a few seconds of injury, and it compresses any filaments which happen to be in the pores. This film shows callos on two sieve plates it's gradually being stained with aniline blue, which shows where the callos is. As you watch, you'll see the stain becoming more intense. Also, if sieve tubes are badly treated, plastids in them release starch grains. In this piece of film, the sieve elements were exposed very carefully so as not to damage them, and then iodine was put on them. It causes the plastids to burst. The starch grains can then move to accumulate over the sieve plates to obstruct them even further. Two questions about pea protein filaments stare us in the face. The first is, how are they arranged in translocating sieve tubes? And the second is, what is their function? What do they do? It might be, of course, that like the callos and the starch grains, they merely serve to block pores when sieve elements are injured but we also have the intriguing possibility that they might be parts of pumps. We know that in streaming cytoplasm, in cells which show cytoplasmic streaming, there are bundles of filaments which are actin, the muscle protein. Could it be that translocation is driven in the same way as cytoplasmic streaming? Is P protein like actin? Unfortunately, P protein turns out to be quite different. It's not like muscle protein at all, which rather knocks that idea on the head. Alternatively, filaments could provide surfaces for an electroosmotic pump. But there are strong arguments against electroosmosis for other reasons. And these are so strong that even one of the originators of the idea, David Fensom, uh, doesn't believe in the idea anymore. One thing seems certain. If there are filaments in the way of flow, then they will cause a resistance to flow, a drag. And there's no doubt that pea protein filaments are a drag to people who want to believe in pressure flow. In fact, it's rather amusing when one reads the literature to realize that people who favor pressure flow are quite happy to accept micrographs which show open pores, whereas people who favor some kinds of pump are quite happy to accept micrographs which show pores with filaments in them. Many people don't realize that pores which are as obstructed with filaments as this one are too obstructed for pressure flow to work. Now, if filaments were to be arranged together in bundles, either in the sieve element lumen or in the pores, then they would cause less drag than if they were distributed uniformly. And this is interesting, because between 1961 and 1975, Dr. Robert Thane developed his idea of transcellular strands. He proposed that translocation is driven through membrane-bound strands or tubes in the sieve elements. And this idea caused a great controversy. He thought that translocation might be driven through them, perhaps by peristalsis, by waves of contraction along the strands. However, the resolution of the light microscope is far too poor to resolve membranes in the sense of a unit membrane. And because uh, membrane-bound strands did not show up in the transmission electron microscope, many people thought that Thane's strands were a complete artifact and did not exist. But I think that Thane was right. And although his observations, uh, his speculations on his observations, went some way beyond what he could see, his uh, speculations were extremely stimulating and very valuable because they led many people to look much more closely at the structure of sieve elements. I think that Thane's strands are, in fact, merely bundles of P-protein filaments. And I'm led to think this because in the transmission electron microscope, in sections of embedded sieve elements, we can find bundles of P-protein filaments. 
and in fresh material. Under the light microscope, we were able to show bundles, and we were able to show bundles of filaments in freeze etch sieve tubes, which had uh, merely been frozen in intact plants, and the freeze etchings examined in a transmission electron microscope. We fixed and dried sieve elements for scanning electron microscopy and cut them open, and we were able to show bundles of filaments there too. This picture draws all our observations of strands together. Here is a sieve plate with pores. Here are the bundles or strands of filaments. On the basis of all these different methods, we concluded that transcellular strands are merely bundles of P-protein filaments. This diagram shows our present view of the structure of the translocating sieve tube. You will see that we still have question marks over the pores. Because sieve tubes are so easily damaged, the problem of the pore structure remains. If we are to calculate whether pressure flow is feasible, then we must know exactly how the filaments are arranged in the pores. This is a critical question, and how can we answer it? The light microscope is no use because it cannot resolve the filaments, not even in the pores. We must turn to electron microscopy. But embedding and uh, sectioning for transmission electron microscopy is not likely to provide a reliable answer because the preparation would cause the filaments to swish about. So I turn to freeze etching. Now, this enables us to freeze sieve elements intact while they're working and lock their contents solid. And what did I find? A whole spectrum of distribution of filaments in pores. Pores which were packed with filaments. Pores that contained fewer filaments, like this one. And there are a few pores with no recognizable filaments in them at all. There didn't seem to be any clear answer to our critical question, what is in the pores between translocating sieve elements? But can this question ever be answered by microscopy? Recently, I looked again at Brownian motion to see how far filaments would move in sieve pores during the fastest conceivable time taken to freeze them. That is, in about one hundredth of a second. And I found that during this time, the filaments might move even so far as the diameter of a pore. And this means that we can't, by means of snapshots taken in the electron microscope, ever discover the exact distribution of filaments in the pores between sieve elements when flow is actually going on through them. We're confronted there with what Sir Arthur Eddington called a postulate of impotence. The electron microscope simply cannot answer our question, is pressure flow uh, as an explanation for translocation possible? And I think that many people who work with sieve tubes haven't realized this limitation yet. A wrong hypothesis, such as Thane's idea of membranes around transcellular strands, can stimulate research. But there seems little point in continuing to use the electron microscope to answer our critical question, how our pores arranged, how our filaments arranged in the pores, um, when the electron microscope simply can't answer it. We've dug about as far as we can go in that particular hole, and uh, we need somewhere else to try digging. I'm developing a special microscope which can measure flow and Brownian motion in sieve tubes which are actually alive and translocating. This microscope works by shining a very small spot of light, about five micrometers in diameter, into cells from a laser. The light is scattered back from the specimen, and if there's motion in the specimen, the frequency of the light is changed by the Doppler effect, in the same way as the sound of a train whistle is raised in pitch when the train is approaching and falls when it goes past. This microscope can tell us how fast particles in cells are moving. If there are particles moving, perhaps by Brownian motion under the laser spot, then the output of the microscope is a spectrum of frequencies. If we connect the electronics to a loudspeaker, then the particles undergoing Brownian motion near a sieve plate produce a hiss. By analyzing the signals from the microscope, we can distinguish between flow and Brownian motion. 
And with the appropriate maths and the aid of a computer, we find that Brownian motion produces exponential curves like this. If we had had flow present, then we would have obtained sine waves. This experiment was actually to measure flow in fine pipes of about the same size as a sieve element. This means that we are now studying the structure of sieve tubes dynamically rather than statically as we were doing with the electron microscope.